Okay, well, as I said, thanks for your prayers for Teresa. Um, and as Tony said, Elaine, uh, if you look watching in on YouTube later, Elaine was due to be speaking this morning, but she um, had an accident at home on Friday. She was prepared to come and preach this morning, but we felt that it was wise that she should stay at home and rest. So it's me uh, at short notice, um, and so I guess with limited time to prepare, but I did feel that I had something on my heart to bring, and I feel led to bring a piece of scripture. Uh, I don't know if you've got that there, Estelle, uh, if there is a PowerPoint there. Yep, yep. Just let that uh, come up. <coughs> so yeah, familiar story. I'm actually going to get the kids to come in when we actually read the story, because I think it would be good for them to hear the story. Um, but um, yeah, yeah, I'll come to that later, the, the story of Daniel, because I think it's relevant to what where we're at as a nation um, and where we're at as believers in this moment in time. It wasn't part of the original um, series, um, although funnily enough, actually, Elaine was due to be preaching from Daniel today, but I don't think she was going to be preaching from this particular passage. Uh, and I'd say to Elaine, if you watch this later, uh, don't watch it. Preach first, then watch it. Because otherwise you might think, oh, I can't say that. Mick's already said it. And just say what you originally purposed to say. If you repeat something, Elaine, that I'm saying this morning, then it must be something that God wants us to hear. So perhaps don't listen to me first. Um, preach your preach first. Okay? Right. So what is going on around us? Well, I think that on a number of fronts, um, the church, Christians, and biblical teaching are being undermined and even at times attacked. And foremost amongst these are marriage, sex, sexuality, gender identity, and abortion. And sometimes by doing what we as Christians would regard as normal and everyday things, things like praying, things like proclaiming what's written in the Bible, we risk being arrested and brought before the courts accused of hate speech and hate crime. You might think I'm sort of scaremongering and exaggerating, but I, I promise you I'm not. These things are happening. These things are happening. We may not be aware of it. It's easy for us perhaps to miss all these things that are going on around, uh, and then we miss it rather than spend time praying about it, which is why I feel it's important this morning just to bring these things before you um, and get us in a place where we can be praying about these things sensibly and with knowledge. Um, and I'm going to be in a moment referring, a bit later on, referring to the story of Daniel, because I think it's a, a story that is right for our times at the moment. So, you know, there's been a high profile public discussion about the nature of marriage, and particularly the issue of same-sex marriage, especially in the Church of England. And it's causing great problems in the Church of England. Um, Justin Welby is coming to Weymouth on the 10th of June. Um, and I know that the local Anglican churches would like to have some very open meetings that people can come and meet Justin Welby. But I also know that some of the ministers, some of the vicars, are actually really feeling quite uncomfortable about Justin Welby coming because of the stance that the church has taken on blessing uh, gay marriage, which they see as being unbiblical. They say the mari biblical marriage is understood as being one man and one woman, and any departure from that is a departure from scripture, which of course it is. And so there is, you know, um, there is a, dis a disquiet amongst some of the Anglican clergy in the town because of this issue, because of the stance that the Church of England 
have taken. A candidate for the leadership of the Scottish National Party was the subject of a sustained media attack because she told the truth. She said that she would have opposed legalising same-sex marriage if she had been a, a, a Scottish MP in those, in when, when the vote was taken. She said that she would have opposed same-sex marriage because of her Christian beliefs. Now, because she held such biblical views, many deemed her unfit to hold high public office. Just think about that for a moment. Let it sink in. If you hold to biblical truth, you are deemed unfit for high political office. Worrying, isn't it? I mean, you would have thought if you hold to biblical views and you have a biblical sense of morality and a biblical sense of what's right and wrong, you would be eminently qualified to hold high political office. But no, it's quite the reverse. Likewise, um, there are cases of people being arrested or sacked from work because they misgendered a trans person. Um, now this uh, whole debate, I mean, there is a, a case of, um, um, I'm just going to see whether I'm... No, I'll come to that later. You know, this whole debate, though, is fraught with, <clears throat> with problems. Where the value and care that we have towards individuals is set against the speaking of plain, honest truth. You know, if someone who was born a man now chooses to say that she is a woman, how do we respond? You know, we, we have a desire to care for the person and we may go along with the person's desire to be called by a female name and female pronouns. You know, we don't want to cause hurt, we don't want to offend them, we want to be humble and full of love and grace. But we cannot, in all honesty, say, and good conscience before God, say that the person is a female. If they were born a male, we cannot now say they're a female. We may perhaps say that they're a trans female. Maybe that there's this new category. There's male, female, and people who want to be known by something different, trans, a trans female or a trans male. Maybe, maybe we do that. But that does not make her a biological female when in fact every cell in his body carries male genetic material. Every cell has got an XY chromosome in it. Everything about, internally, everything about that person, if they were born a male, is male. So we have this dilemma. But people are being arrested for refusing to go along with the lie. A teacher was sacked from his job by refusing to call a boy she and he. And a street preacher was arrested for calling a passing trans woman, sir. You know, both felt that they could not engage with what they believed were lies. The boy was a boy and the trans woman was a man. Now, as I say, from a caring point of view, we, we can perhaps go along and call the person by the name they want to be known by. If they want to be known by she, we can call them she. If they want to you know, be known by he, we can, we can go along with that. But we can't, I think, in all good conscience, go along with something that we know to be not true. If God has created someone as a man, and they've got within them the genetic material of a man, we cannot say they are a woman. So we have this dilemma of wanting to care for people, but also wanting to uphold truth. There is truth. Truth exists. It's not, it's not flaky. It doesn't waver. Oh, well, it might be a bit true. Well, that's your truth. This is my truth. No, no, there's truth. 
truth exists. In the area of abortion, we've reached the situation where it's an arrestable offence to pray in a certain place, even if it's silently in your head. Can you imagine that? If you pray quietly in your head and you admit to it, you can be arrested. How ridiculous is that? They've set up exclusion zones around abortion clinics where it's an offence to demonstrate against abortion because it's deemed threatening towards women going to use the clinics. Now, I get that to a certain degree. I get that. And I certainly wouldn't want to see the scenes here that we see sometimes in the pictures in America where you've got loads of people demonstrating and shouting the most vile, abusive slogans at women going to have an abortion. That's not right. And that's not how God would want us to behave. That's not love. Okay, we don't want that. I don't want that. But these recent cases were not like that. These were two different people at two different times. One of them, I think, was a Catholic priest. They were arrested for silently praying within an exclusion zone outside of opening hours of the clinic. Outside of the opening hours of the clinic. There was no risk of threatening somebody because the clinic wasn't open for people to be going there. They were just doing it quietly. They weren't threatening anybody. They weren't offending anybody. The clinic was closed. They happened to be in the exclusion zone and they were praying quietly. They weren't even praying out loud. They weren't even praying with other people. They were quietly on their own praying. And they were arrested. So silent prayer is not permitted in the exclusion zone. In effect, it's like it's a thought crime to be arrested for what you're thinking in the quiet of your own head. Very concerning. Very concerning. Now, I think I'm right in saying that in both cases, they were acquitted and the court ruled that there was no offence by praying. Of course, that's what we would expect. But I think the lady went back and did it again and she's been arrested again even though they've established in court that it was not an offence to pray outside quietly. But she's been arrested again. Uh, We'll wait to hear the outcome of that. No doubt it will be the same. But it's very concerning. Who stands to gain if we're not allowed to pray? Well, we know who that is, don't we? So our battle is not against flesh and blood, but against spiritual wickedness in heavenly places. So the story I want to look at is Daniel in the lion's den. It's a well-known story to many. So let's just read some verses. Should we get the kids in to uh, just hear the story? Is that okay? They might want to come in and, and just hear the story. If you're looking on in Zoom, on uh, YouTube, we're just waiting for our kids to come back in to hear this story of, of Daniel. Yeah, of course. Yeah, he said these things will happen. They happen to him, they'll happen to us. Come in, guys, a minute. Izaki, come here a minute. Just come and hear a story. It's a good story. It's a good Bible story. Okay. Izaki, do you know the story of Daniel in the lion's den? No. Okay, you do. Okay. Okay, all right, okay. Here's a story, this is a true story. 
I reckon it happened probably about 3,000 years ago, I'm guessing. I don't know exactly. I didn't look at that in, in the, in the um, writing. But I think it's probably about 3,000 years ago. And it's a true story. Um, and it uh, occurred, I think, in Babylon, um, in the, probably an area which would now equate to somewhere like Syria or Turkey or somewhere around there. It said, it pleased Darius to appoint 120 satraps, that's the title of these people, to rule throughout the kingdom with three chief ministers over them so that the king might not suffer loss. So he's, put the, he's delegated all of his power to other people, but he's put a few people in charge just to make sure that nobody's swindling him and nobody is kind of on the take, all right? Um, now Daniel so distinguished himself among the chief ministers and the satraps by his exceptional qualities that the king planned to set him over the whole kingdom. At this, the chief ministers and the satraps tried to find grounds for charges against Daniel in his conduct of government affairs, but they were unable to do so. They could find no corruption in him because he was trustworthy and neither corrupt nor negligent. He didn't do anything wrong. He did it brilliantly. He was great at being like the prime minister. Okay, he didn't do it badly. He did it really well. <clears throat> Finally, these men said, we will never find any basis for charges against this man, Daniel, unless it has something to do with the law of his God. The only way we're going to get him if, it's, if, if we can make something against him being a believer in God. Okay? So these chief ministers and satraps went as a group to the king and said, making Darius live forever. The royal ministers, prefects, satraps, advisors and governors have all agreed that the king should issue an edict and enforce the decree that anyone who prays to any god or human being during the next 30 days, except to you, your majesty, shall be thrown into the lion's den. Now, your majesty, issue the decree and put it in writing so that it cannot be altered in accordance with the law of the Medes and Persians, which cannot be repealed. The law of the Medes and Persians, once it was law, you couldn't change it, all right? So King Darius put the decree in writing. Okay. Now, when Daniel learned that the decree had been published, he went home to his upstairs room where the windows opened towards Jerusalem. Three times a day he got down on his knees and prayed, giving thanks to God just as he had done before. Then these men went as a group and found Daniel praying and asking God for help. So they went to the king and spoke to him about his royal decree. Did you not publish a decree that during the next 30 days, anyone who prays to any god or human being except to you, your majesty, would be thrown into the lion's den? The king answered, the decree stands in accordance with the law of the Medes and Persians, which cannot be repealed. Then they said to the king, Daniel, who is one of the exiles from Judah, pays no attention to you, your majesty, or the decree you put in writing. He still prays three times a day. When the king heard this, he was greatly distressed and he was determined to rescue Daniel. And he made every effort until sunset to save him. Now, the king really liked Daniel. He thought, he's the best person that I have in the whole of government. But of course, these people had kind of managed to trick the king into issuing a law that made Daniel look as if he was breaking the law. He wasn't, but, you know, that was what was going on. 
So, so the um, okay. So the king gave the order. I've just jumped a bit here. Although he, the king was nothing, the king could do about it. He'd made the order. The law was the law. He had to keep with it. So the king gave the order, and they brought Daniel and threw him into the lion's den. The king said to Daniel, "May your God." whom you serve continually, rescue you. And then a bit further on. At the first light of dawn, the king got up and hurried to the lion's den. He's thrown Daniel into this den of hungry lions. Okay? And he thinks that Daniel is going to have been completely eaten up by all these lions. When he came to the den, he called to Daniel in an anguished voice, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you serve continually, been able to rescue you from the lions? What a silly question. God is powerful enough to rescue somebody from lions? Of course he is. Daniel answered, may the king live forever. My God sent his angel and he shut the mouths of the lions. They have not hurt me because I was found innocent in his sight, nor have I ever done anything wrong before you, your majesty. And the king was overjoyed and gave orders to lift Daniel out of the den. It was sort of like, you know, it was in a pit and you just chucked them in and they fell down into the pit and that was the lions. But this time it didn't happen like that. Okay. And when Daniel was lifted from the den, no wound was found on him because he had trusted in his God. At the king, this is the, oh, this is the interesting bit. At the king's command, the men who had falsely accused Daniel were brought in and they were thrown into the lion's den, along with their wives and children. And before they reached the floor, the lions overpowered them and crushed all their bones. And had dinner, no doubt. <laughs> I issue a decree that in every part of my kingdom, people must fear and reverence the God of Daniel, for he is the living God. He endures forever. His kingdom will not be destroyed. His dominion will never end. He rescues and saves. He performs signs and wonders in the heavens and on the earth. He has rescued Daniel from the power of lions. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Good story. Yeah? They say I mean, you know, if you were looking for a story of grace in the Old Testament, I don't think you can probably get a better one than that, really. The amazing grace of God towards Daniel in preserving his life when he's been thrown into a pit of hungry lions um, who are looking for something to eat, but God shut their mouths and they didn't touch him at all. Amazing. Okay, so here we have a situation where unrighteous people <clears throat> with hidden agendas are using devious means to get unrighteous laws passed that prevent Daniel from praying to his God and seeking to remove him from any place of influence. Isn't that what we're seeing happening to the church and to the voice of the Christians today. We're trying, you know, people are trying to subvert the law, make things an offence that should never be an offence, and, you know, and they proclaim that um, what God says in the Bible is viewed as hate speech, and laws are being passed to make it a hate crime. That's what's happening. Unjust people unrighteous people making unrighteous laws to try to stop prayer, to try to stop proclamation of the gospel. Okay, what was Daniel's response to this attack? 
Well, we're told that he continued to pray, continued to give thanks to God, continued to ask God for help, and he also he told the king what God had done. I've already said that. What does this story say to us in today's society that, you know, in today's society that doesn't value the truth shown in the Bible? So, he kept praying, he kept trusting in God, and he kept proclaiming the truth about God. And that is just what we need to do. We need to keep praying. We don't know what David prayed. Sorry, Daniel prayed. But we do know in chapter 9 of Daniel, the prayer of David is recorded, a prayer of David is recorded, where he laments the state of his nation. And maybe that's what we should be doing, acknowledging how far our nation is from God and asking for him to move in our nation. Maybe that's where our prayers need to start. <clears throat> we need to keep trusting God. God is not at all concerned at the, law, at the laws passed by King Darius, nor the influence upon our laws of LGBTQ activists or anybody else. And in fact, Psalm 37 says, the wicked plot against the righteous and gnash their teeth at them. But the Lord laughs at the wicked, for he knows their day is coming. The Lord laughs at the wicked. The Lord is always secure, and so are we in him. Whatever seems to be happening, we can keep trusting. And we know that Daniel kept asking for help. We need to keep asking for help. You know, when Daniel prayed for help, he knew that there was nothing he could do to change what was going on around him. But he also knew that change was possible, but only through God. Nothing he could do, but if there was going to be change, it had to come through God. When we pray to God for help, we are admitting that there is nothing that we can do by our own cleverness or skill or anything else that we possess that will change the situation. But we're still trusting that the situation can't be changed. There's nothing we can do, but we're believing that the, the situation can be changed, but only through God. There's nothing we can do, but the situation is not hopeless. Not at all. We can pray and we can ask for help. That's the most powerful thing that we can do. And the other thing that we can do is to continue to proclaim the gospel. Daniel continued to tell the truth about what God had done. Now the gospel is not focusing on people's sins. It's focusing on the forgiveness on offer through Jesus to all who will repent and believe. It's telling what God has done, not what people have done wrong. It's not about telling people how bad they are. It's about telling people how good God is. That's the gospel. That's what Daniel did. He told the king what God had done. Do you notice he didn't point the finger at his accusers? He didn't moan, oh, those horrible people, king, they, they tricked you into doing this. He didn't mention them. He just said what God had done. You know, because the truth is, even if somehow people at large in society, those who would be against what the Bible said, even if they suddenly change their view of marriage, 
Even if they suddenly change their view of sexuality, gender, and abortion, and their thinking became more aligned with, say, the traditional views of the previous generations and of the Bible itself, that wouldn't stop them from standing before God on the judgment day with their sins unforgiven. They could get all of these things right. They could suddenly start thinking, oh no, no, marriage needs to be like this. Sex needs to be like this. Life of unborn children needs to be, took, needs to be dealt with like this. They could get all of their thinking right in those areas, but unless they come to Jesus for forgiveness, they're still lost. So it's not about getting people to think right about marriage. It's not about people getting people to think right about sexuality. It's actually about people getting to know Jesus. That's our gospel. Okay? They need the grace of God in sins forgiven, not lectures in morality and right living. That's going to get them nowhere. And what was the outcome? Well, Daniel's prayers were answered. He was delivered from evil. He was rescued from the plans of his enemies. And more than that, his enemies were destroyed. Jesus told us to pray, deliver us from evil. Okay, you know the Lord's Prayer as well as I do. Deliver us from evil. Well, it must be a prayer that God wants to answer. Jesus wouldn't tell us to pray something that God didn't want to answer. Okay, so if Jesus is telling us to pray, deliver us from evil, it must be something that God will answer. Because Jesus told us to do it. We have an enemy. Physically, that enemy is seen in those who try to promote ungodliness and suppress the truth of the gospel. Those who accuse us of hate speech. Those who, you know, when we proclaim the truth of God. But they're not really the enemy. Our enemy is Satan and his demonic hordes who seek to obscure the glory of God and pervert the truth of the gospel. And our weapons are not weapons of protest, although I guess there's nothing wrong in taking part in the systems of the world. You know, we have got as much right to vote as anybody else. We have got as much right to express an opinion as anybody else. And it's fine that we do that. But they're not our weapons. Our weapons are spiritual and effective in prayer and praise to our God. The outcome will be no different from Daniel's. God will be with us and he will be for us. Now that doesn't mean we won't face persecution. In fact, the Bible says we will. Okay? It's a given. So don't be too alarmed when you hear of people being put into prison because of their belief. God said those sort of things can happen. When they take you before the courts, don't worry what you're going to say. You know, it's there. It's going to happen. But the ultimate victory will be God's. And we will be shown to be blameless and in the right. If we're proclaiming the truth of the gospel, we'll be shown to be blameless and in the right. And in these ungodly times, we need to keep praying, I thought there was one more. Okay. We need to keep praying, praising God, and proclaiming the gospel. We need to keep praying, praising God, and proclaiming the gospel. That's what we do. That's our weapon against all that's going on around us. Praying. Continuing to pray. We're aware of what's going on around us. We're aware of the issues. We're aware of... of the ungodliness that's taking place around us, we pray about it. We praise God because he is king and Lord and sovereign in everything that goes on, and he still is. And we proclaim the gospel to people. They need to hear the gospel, that they need their sins forgiven. They don't need to be told, live your life this way, live your life that way, because that won't get them anywhere. Nobody ever got to heaven by living a good life. The only way anybody ever got to heaven was by accepting Jesus into their life and being forgiven for their sins. That's how you get to heaven. That's how you get right with God. And that's the gospel that we want to preach. Amen? Amen. Great.